think uh, what we can do is just talk about stuff that people aren't allowed to talk about. Um, and that's why it's called Challenging Beliefs. It's from your book, Challenging Beliefs. And it's not about medicine, and it's not about science. And it is about medicine, and it could be about science, and it could be about sports, it could be about CrossFit, it could be about my sore leg. <laughs> it could be why <laughs> I mistakenly thought I was fitter than I really am. So I don't know, that's what it is. Is that cool? That sounds excellent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so look, let's get straight to it. Um, what is the next belief that you think needs to be challenged? Well, I think we've just thrown out the belief that carbohydrates are essential for muscle metabolism. Yeah. For, so that's, the story goes back to the 1967. So I start medicine in 1969, and I go right into physiology in 1970. And the first paper I've ever come across is a 1967 paper where the Scandinavians have put a needle biopsy into the muscle and taken out a bit of glycogen. And this is, it completely re renews sports science and becomes a new direction. Why did they do it? I mean, you don't just stick a needle into someone's yeah. leg fat. I mean, were they looking for something? They must have been looking for glycogen, for carbohydrates, but it was a technique used to study muscle disease in chronic on patients. So there's a thing called Duchenne syndrome, which is in children, it's a hereditary condition. And Duchenne had developed the muscle biopsy technique because he wanted to look at the, the, the histology, what the appearance of the muscle was. So they used the same needle, but they now applied it to healthy people, whereas before it had only been used in sick people with this particular disease. So anyway, then they came up with the theory that glycogen was everything, and for 30, 40 years, I believed that and spoke about it and promoted it as did everyone else in the world. Okay, so some people that are gonna be listening to us aren't gonna be scientists or medical. So what does it mean, glycogen in your leg, in your body? Okay, so when you, when you eat carbohydrates, you store it in the body in two places, okay. in the liver yes. and in the muscles. All right, so glycogen, you see like kind of glucose or sugar. Yeah, sugar exactly stuff. right, okay. and it, that gets stored. Okay. And the problem is you have much less carbohydrate or glycogen in the body than you have fat. So you, have you can fat, you could run for four days, whereas what they realized was there was only glycogen for perhaps two hours or three hours of exercise. So then it became obvious that this was going to be a limiting factor. So then they did some really good studies, but they weren't properly controlled. And they, at the time, I think these people wanted just to prove that they were right. And that's what happens. You, you get a belief that this is going to be true. And so you, you look plan, for evidence you plan that the supports studies. your theory Absolutely. rather than the evidence and title. Yeah. Okay. So the error they made, and which we, we overlooked, and which I only saw about nine months ago. Nine months ago? Nine, nine months ago. Okay. Nine months ago. Hold it, this has now been an exercise scientist for 40 years. Okay, so what have you been missing? Yeah, I see not very good at what you do. <laughs> okay. No, it's, that's what happens, because you are so brainwashed, you don't see. And so what I didn't see was that on the studies showing that these people became glycogen depleted as they were exercising, and they ran out of glycogen and they stopped. At the same time, their blood glucose levels had fallen to incredibly low levels. Okay. Now we knew up to that time that blood glucose levels are very important. And I'll talk, as we go along, I'll tell you that we were actively researching that and about that, but we were focusing on glucose because it was much easier to measure. So anyway, when I go back now nine months ago and see the same graphs, which I had seen for 40 years and published in 1967, their blood glucose levels were incredibly low. And then I said, oh, look, they overlooked something. They overlooked that these people were hypoglycemic. Yes. They had low blood glucose concentrations at the same time that they were glycogen depleted. So you could not conclude, absolutely could not conclude that it was glycogen depletion in muscles that was causing you to stop. So it could have been either. Could it it be could have been either. Yeah, absolutely. Either. Okay. But, but, but. But they but. said it was glycogen. They said, that was a convenient excuse. Yeah. So then what you've got to do is just take more carbs. Exactly right. But lots of carbs. Co and you that is carb why. Load. Yeah. And that is why people were told to eat. We told people to eat 500 grams to a kilogram of carbohydrate before exercise. Thank you very much for yeah. this. <laughs> yeah. That was a quite and extreme. <laughs> eating a lot of pasta. This is lovely. Thank you. And if you're in the Tour de France, you were told to eat a kilogram of carbohydrate a day. A kilogram. Now, what that does to the rest of your body, it completely messes up your metabolism, as, as we'll discuss. So anyway, so then I saw, I said, okay, if the glyc glucose is low, how many studies are there supposedly showing that carbohydrates helped by making your muscles full of carbohydrate? 
when in what they'd actually done was to make your liver full of glucose and keep your blood glucose higher. And I found 40 such studies. 40 studies where they claimed that it was due to muscle glycogen depletion, but at the same time, the, the, these people were blood glucose depleted. They claimed what was due to glycogen so depletion? They, they, the, they the claimed that the fatigue, fatigue, that's fatigue. right. And then I started looking more carefully, and you could see whenever the glucose falls, the performance falls about 30 minutes later. So take it back to my own experience as an athlete. Okay. So well, let's go back to 1979. Bruce Fordyce is lying third in the Comrades Marathon, and he is struggling, and he's feeling terrible, and his father gives him a drink. And Bruce drinks this and suddenly perks up and storms off and finishes third. He asks his father what was in that drink, and his father says it was Coke and sh buckets of sugar. So Bruce says, that's all I'm ever drinking ever again. You okay. see. 19, we go forward two years, 1981, I'm at the finish of the Comrades and we're studying athletes, we're studying particularly, are they hypoglycemic? I mean, can you believe it? This is 1991 and I'm still talking muscle glycogen, not, not blood glucose. And we found that there was about 10% of the athletes finished the race and their glucoses were pretty low. So it looked like it was important. Bruce then phones me and he says, what should he be drinking when he's exercising? And you said Coca-Cola. <laughs> so, I can't believe it. So we said... <laughs> Tons of Coke. <laughs> we said you need glucose polymer. That sounds like plastic. Corn syrup. Um, and so this is, this is glucose with long chain. Okay. It's not just single glucose, glucose long chains. And why? Because we were researching it and you could see that if you, the more long chain it is, the quicker it's emptied from your stomach and therefore Fast potentially the quicker it into the blood and to blah, blah, blah. And that was what we were studying at that time because we could do that. We hadn't yet become really sophisticated and monitoring glucose molecules traveling around the body, which is what we eventually did. And so we together, Bruce and myself and Bernard Rose, who was the marathon runner champion, we developed a product called Lepin FRN, Ford Ice Rose Nokes which was the first squeezy. It was 25 grams of carbs that you cut the top off on you or you squeeze it into your mouth when you were running. Yes, all right, yeah. That's that stuff. <laughs> That's a, disgusting. Absolutely, and then we had a carbo load as well. We had a carbo load drink and the carbo load solutions that you, that you took in before the comrades. And so that was, but we were funded by the company and they were really funny because I mean, the first funding we ever got was before the Stellenbosch Marathon one year. And we had a group of, I think, about 15 athletes who we biopsied before they ran the marathon, which is quite something. I mean, they came That's the night brave, before. Yeah. And we biopsied them, and then we biopsied them at the end. And we were looking specifically for low blood glucose, but we couldn't find it. And only later did we realize that to get low blood glucose, you have to starve the people for about 18 hours, and then it'll happen within two hours. Okay, so there wasn't enough time between the end of the race and the biopsy? The, 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 the race was too short, so oh, the so race was too short, oh, okay. really. And they took carbohydrates, and if you, if you take in carbohydrates, you don't need much to prevent hypoglycemia. Okay. So anyway, as I was evolving this idea nine months ago, then I went and looked at, the, I looked at all the studies, and I had discovered that people had obviously described it. So they, they over describe what? they describe what that it has to happen. You have to become hypoglycemic during prolonged exercise if you don't take carbohydrate. It has to happen. Right. It's, if the event's long enough, it'll happen. You eventually run out of gas. You have to run out of carbohydrate of carbohydrates in the bloodstream. Yes. It has to happen, and the reason is because the system is. And then uh, we only worked out the system in the last few months. When you exercise for a long time, you're, you start to burn more and more fat. At an increasing rate. At an increasing rate. Because you, you become more efficient, more inefficient, more tired. You, you, mm -hmm. As you become tired, you become more inefficient in your burning. How does it work? No, it's because your insulin drops. <laughs> so uh, your blood yeah. insulin levels drop the further away you are from your last meal. And as your insulin drops, then your fat cells start to release fat. So then the fat can be used by the by the muscles instead of carbohydrate. So that's happening. And I mean, that I've taught, taught students that for 40 years, but what I didn't know, and no one had pointed this out, no one, until three months ago, was that the glucose in the bloodstream doesn't follow the same pattern. 
So you would think if your whole body is burning less carbohydrate, you'd also be burning less glucose in the, in the bloodstream. It doesn't happen, it actually rises. So now your problem is you, the liver is becoming more and more depleted of glucose, but the body is demanding more glucose from the bloodstream. And when, that, when ultimately then the blood glucose must drop, the liver runs out of glucose and you become hypoglycemic. And the question I asked, well, why are the two systems controlled differently? Why do you burn less muscle glycogen but more liver glycogen during exercise? There has to be a reason. You know, we didn't evolve this way for nothing. And the answer is, it's because your brain needs the glucose. And so what... Well, of course, you know, that's what your brain needs. Absolutely. Your brain runs on glucose. Correct. But endogenous... What? Endogenous, endogenous right. glucose. Right. Glucose is made inside your body by your liver. Yeah. So your that liver stops putting your blood, it shoots it to your brain. Correct. And it becomes more and more difficult for the liver to do that the longer you exercise. So, so the reason so is that why when you exercise and you get that kind of foggy haze, your mental faculties close down Absolutely. and you can only focus that's on it. very, very, very that's narrow it. things. That's it. That's exactly that's hyperglycemia. For me, what I used to okay. feel was that I couldn't finish the race. I wasn't going to finish this race. And within five minutes of taking cars, off you go again. So it has an emotional component as well. Because yeah. that is, I mean, I remember running and you're going, <laughs> you're obviously in pain, but yeah. there's like a, quite an emotional, visceral yeah. reaction as well. Or maybe the, I don't know. Now that's, that's the brain controlling you. So, so the brain is regulating this whole system. It's telling you to slow down. It's telling you to slow Just down. And if you, don't don't listen, if, it don't, if you don't listen, it gives you more significant symptoms, including the emotion. And, and what we know in sport is once your emotion comes involved, you're in trouble. Yes. So if you get a negative emotion, your performance is going to go down. Okay. So that's what we've, so we've worked out now that you actually only need a small amount of carbohydrate when you're exercising uh, for a long time. Just a little small bit. Amount. Small, small amount, 20 grams, 25 grams an hour. But I thought you'd retire. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> And so how did you get, why, why are you looking back at Oh, the, no, the, brilliant. Oh, you've well, missed, I've missed something. Yeah, you have. You've, you've told me about the last, my, I'm going to, well, I don't know. We haven't so minuted this at a board meeting. No, so the guy, <laughs> the guy who's looking after the mountains in Cape Town to make sure they don't have any fires okay. is a guy, guy called Philip Prince. And he's an older guy. He's not quite as old as me, but he has a younger son who happens to be in Pennsylvania. And he contacted me and he said, Tim, I'd like to do some research with you because he has a lovely laboratory at the Grove College University in, in Pennsylvania. And he was just setting up his laboratory, getting going, and he said, why don't we study low-carb diets and performance? So, you know, I had no clue how good he would be or whatever. Mm. So I said, well, why don't we? And I gave him some ideas. So the first study we did was people running five kilometers on the treadmill when they were eating a high-carb diet for 42 days or when they'd eaten a high-fat diet for 42 days. And he did it magnificently. I mean, the, the control was superb. Because these things are important. You've got to have, like if you've got 10 people, five have got to do the one trial diet and five do the other diet, and then you've got to co reverse them. And there's a lot of work to so keep. So just talk about the control, because I think yeah. there, are lot of, there are not many people that understand the scientific process. Yeah. You yeah. can't just give some people that and give other people that. You've got to control for so many different things so that there's no confounders, is that, what, is that what you call it? You've got to so, eliminate yeah. all the differences and make sure that, you've, that you're measuring like for like. Correct. So that you can measure the differential in the performance. Correct. Okay. So this, we want to put these people on a high carbohydrate diet for a period and then a low carbohydrate diet for a period. And it's got to be 42 days. Why 42? Well, we, did, we thought Six it would take that long okay. to adapt. And in fact, we now know it only takes about four weeks and you can get the same outcomes after four weeks. But anyway, six okay. weeks was, was safe. And then you've got to make sure they eat the same diet for the sick 42 days. So you have to have a marker. And the beauty with the low carb diet is you become ketotic. So, and we check their blood ketones every day. So did and they get sent a little care package? We didn't do that in this. We told okay. them what to eat and made sure that they were eating it. Okay. You know, a more expensive study would be you would provide that, sure. but we were a small lab and yeah. couldn't do it. So anyway, so, this, so then you've got to put the, you start with 10. And you've got to have them doing it at the same time because their training is going to differ and so on. And so that's the problem. You've got to get the trial done within a period when their all fitness stays the same and doesn't change. So they can't suddenly go and start run races and do all sorts of other things. And they've got to keep training. So, and then you start with five on the one diet and five on the other diet, and then they cross over after 42 days. But they swap? They swap because then they swap the diets. 
so that they're first eating a carb, low carb diet for, for 42 days. We then test them. We test them during those 42 days. Then they convert to the high carbohydrate diet and they do okay. another 42 days. So you can see it's, it's not simple to, no, no, to do it. There's a lot properly. of work there. And then when you study them, we measure a lot of things while they're running on the, laboratory, on the treadmill. Anyway, the short, long and short of it was that after 42 days on either diet, the performance was identical. Now that's not allowed to happen, well, because it can't happen because they're not, if you're not eating carbs, you can't run 5Ks at four minutes a K. It's not possible. That's what, that's what we taught. So that was a fabulous study. And then about, about three months ago, I said, hold it, we, didn't, we had done other work on these athletes. We'd actually tested their so-called VO2 max where you get them to run, start at a low intensity, and then they run faster and faster and faster until they can't run any more. And just the VO2 max measures the amount of oxygen your blood can absorb. And your and you muscles can use. Arm, muscles and you used. measure the oxygen going in and, and the oxygen coming, coming out. That, okay. That's correct. Right. And the difference tells you how much what you can absorb. Using. And so to have a higher VO2 max means that you're more efficient. Ex you, you burn oxygen faster. Yeah, you've got a greater capacity to burn oxygen. Okay. Which yeah. is one of the fuels. That's correct. And then they, the old theory was that that makes you a better runner the more oxygen you can burn. What? It's a little is bit that the old theory? It's old. Well, it's not true. It's not true because it's the other factors that okay. are involved. So why don't we still measure VO2 max? Ah, because we're sports scientists, we have to have, be able to tell you how good you are. <laughs> okay, oh, you put a high VO2 max. Okay, cool. Yeah, I've got your CV. If you read Law of Running, it says how fast you run is all you need to know. So you just look at how okay. fast you run 5Ks and then we'll know. So that was, so, so then we had tested them in this way and we'd fortunately measured their oxygen exchange at every work rate. So they start a very slow work rate, they go faster and faster and faster. So then we can work out what they're burning at different percentages of their maximum. We can work out how much carbohydrate they're burning and how much fat they're burning. And we measured them, did this test before they ate the high fat diet and after they ate the high fat diet. Okay. Now, so we found that the performance was no different. So if the theory is correct, their metabolism should have been exactly the same because the because we taught that metabolism drives your performance. Okay. So therefore, if the performance is the same, the metabolism must be the same. But. But. So. <laughs> okay. There's a but. I can feel the but. Yeah. So we found, of course, that wasn't the case. That the people who'd adapt to the high fat diet burned fat right up to almost the peak intensity, which is just just unheard of. It's completely unheard of. Okay. So then. That's, as a scientist, that's interesting. Yeah. But what does that mean in the real world? What does, what's the consequence of that finding? Well, it, what tells, we you, it tells you that humans evolved to, to burn anything that they've got. And so they could adapt. So my view would be that the traditional hunters, the human hunters many million years ago, they burned fat because that's what they were eating. They were eating protein and fat. Well, they weren't having some chips and a coke. No, absolutely. And a bar one. And so the system had to be adapted to burn lots of fat. Well, and it so started off yeah. as a fat burn. It's, yeah. I suppose it's adapted to burn sugar now. Yeah, and that, but now that happens after the muscle biopsies introduced by the Scandinavians in 1967. So what I next did, said, when did the dietary advice to runners change? Guess what, 1970. And that was when the biopsy was introduced. Because they thought. Because now, so I went back and looked at, I, I managed to find a paper which showed what the Olympic athletes were given at the Olympic dinners, you know, when they, uh, and the halls where they, where the people were kept, you know, the, the, mm. the village, the village, that's what I mean, that's the word I'm looking for. So at the village, what were they given? And you go back to the 1910, nine, it was all protein and fat, they ate meat. It was just food. It just food, that's It wasn't right. protein and fat, exactly. it was uh, exactly. what we eat, this is what we eat, exactly. this is food now. And it only changes in 1970. Like and markedly or like slightly uh, or just like that. just like that. Pasta, rice, and bread becomes a major feature. Yeah. And this is what the scientists say, because we have got definitive proof that you need a high carbohydrate diet if you're an athlete. So that's how ingrained it is. So what we've shown there is that it's nonsense. It doesn't matter what you eat. As long as you're getting reasonable food and you're not nutrient deficient, your performance will be the same. So what's happened in the last two weeks, I've just got the most recent data from Philip, 
in where he asked me, he said, what should the next study we do? I said, well, our problem was five kilometers is still too long. The guys will say, oh, but they were running low intensity. It's still, you still haven't proven it. So I said, we've got to do one mile, test of the one mile. So then, and I said, but more than that, we have to do repetitions. We have to do 800 meter repetitions, at least six, because no one will argue that you've got enough glycogen in your muscles if you're eating a high fat diet. You've got enough glycogen to last six intervals. It wouldn't, you run out of glycogen long before that. And you're running at 800 meter pace, not 500. Yeah, running not at 5 k pace. So you're running at? Running as fast as they, they can. Okay. So we've just got the data and it's unbelievable. There's absolutely no difference in performance, again, okay. either in the one mile or in the eight, six times 800 meter repetitions. But what's more interesting, here they are running the 800 meter repetitions and the last one, they're burning more fat than anyone has ever measured in a human athlete. The, they are running as hard as they can at 800 meters and they're burning more fat than has ever been measured in any athlete under any other circumstances. And any drop off in performance? No, the performance goes like this. It goes, it does go up a bit and then they get it. Compared to the control, compared but to the sugar it's gas? It's identical, it's identical. Absolutely identical. In fact, the, the, the guys on the higher fat diet did slightly better. And if we'd had a hundred athletes, we probably would have shown it was significantly better. But Why yeah. do you say that? Just because the group... You need, if you're looking for a small difference, you need a lot of people to show it. So the point is that if you have to have 100 people, it means the difference is so small, it's probably irrelevant. Oh, okay. But to an Olympic athlete, it might be important. But the key was also... Yeah, well, of course, because an Olympic athlete yeah. operates at the extreme margins. Absolutely. It's like 0, 0.0 seconds, exactly. 0, 0, 0.01 second. You know, that makes the world yeah. record. But the key was that the guys on the high fat diet lost more weight. They lost two kilograms or so, which is exactly how it comes from. The, it's the visceral fat, that's what you lose. All the belly stuff. All the belly stuff, which you can't lose on a high carbohydrate diet, however athletic you are. And that has two consequences, you're lighter, yeah. your performance is better, you're not dragging as much gut around. Correct. And so you've got more available energy to actually run rather than carry your stomach. Yeah. And it goes, so the study, this was not my contribution, this is Philip's contribution. He managed to get some really good people involved and they gave us, we could test all the blood parameters you look for metabolic syndrome and so on, so those have been done. But we also had these guys wearing a glucose monitor for the period that they were training. So we've got four weeks data when they're eating the high fat diet and the high carbohydrate diet. And that's going to be pivotal data because it will show you, this is what happens if you tell athletes to eat high carbohydrate diets. Not only don't they run any better, but their glucose is all over this place. Whereas if they're eating a high fat diet, the glucose is nice and okay. stable. So, so from a scientific point of view, yeah. understood. What effect does that have on the guy running the race? Is he feeling better? Is he feeling more calm? Is his body a more comfortable place to be during the event? What, you know, I yeah. listen to this and I'm excited because I know that you're excited and I know that this is but, something that we care about. Yeah. But to someone listening to this, they're going, okay, yeah, but so what? Well, how do, what's the real world effect of this? To let's just say, you know, if, let's yeah. just say that a sports center decided, okay, cool, we're going to move all of our, you know, athletes onto this program. What is the effect of that? Are they going to be healthier human beings? Absolutely, I think that's the key. And, and the first, they're going to be able to control their weight much better. And I think that. So I've just done a, a series for a group of female rugby players in Britain, and their problem is they're told to eat carbs. And obviously, if you're playing rugby, you're more endomorphic. You've also got slightly more fat. And that, those girls will have great trouble controlling their weight if they're eating a high-carbohydrate diet. You put them on a high-fat, high-protein diet, and their weight control will be like that, and their performance will not change. It'll be, if anything, it'll be better. So I think that... And when I, what frustrates me is, you know, when I started running com marathons in 7, 1971 or 72, if you didn't finish in three hours, that was it. I mean, there, there was no one finishing over three hours. What? Yeah, no, I'm not joking. If you didn't Is that because in... there were only fit people running? Yeah. Now it's become more of a Absolutely. sport where it's more inclusive. Absolutely. So if you couldn't run under three hours, well, you, you, you just didn't run. Don't bother. Yeah, and everyone was lean. But today, everyone, you know, the majority of runners are fat, quite frankly, by comparison. Well, I, look, I always look at that and I go, you know, 
If you're out here, it's Saturday morning at seven o'clock. You could be at home, lying in bed, eating Snickers, and you're watching Netflix. So I always tip my hat to the fat guy, the fat woman, and just go, okay, well, that's great. So at least you're out. You know, but so, it's, it's not helping. You see, the exercise is not going to help. You've got to get your weight down. Well, you can't outrun a bad diet. Yeah, exactly. And if you're carrying abdominal fat, that's, that's the killer. And you've got to get rid of it. And you just look at all these people. And what do they do? I mean, when I last ran the two oceans, half marathon, what are they given? As we walked over the line? Coca-Cola. You're given a Coca-Cola. I threw it away. I said, where's the water? No, you can't get water. The guy told me. <laughs> so, but then that's your reward for running it. And also you haven't taken sugar for a few minutes, so you've got to get the sugar high again. So those are, those are the issues. You're going, to feel, you're going to be much more productive as a human being and, and you can live longer. And I always make this point that at my age of 73, or 72 and a half, now you start noticing who's been eating the high-carb diets at your age. And well, I mean, I see, like. it, I see it with people that I'm in school with. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I'm 47. Yeah, exactly. you know, and you see people with really ruddy complexions, yeah. carrying a lot of weight. I, mean, I got put in a WhatsApp group yeah. for our school reunion. And I looked through the pictures, yeah. because, you know, on the group yeah. you can see, there are people there that I just didn't recognize. And I'm not a person with a bad recollection of my time yeah, at school. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I had quite recent <laughs> recollections of my time at school. <laughs> As I recall. But I, <laughs> but I was looking through it and I was like, I don't, I don't know who these people yeah, are. Yeah. And I'd clock the names and go, oh my goodness, that's, that's quite something. Yeah. And the problem is they've all got insulin resistance. And unless they work out that they're insulin resistant and they can't eat carbs, and they've got a sugar addiction, until they work that out, they're in a, their health is going to be a disaster. They're heading for heart disease, cancers, dementias. So yeah. this, now we're going to challenge beliefs. Yeah. Um, who or what, let's say who, this research when it's released and it's published, hopefully it's going to be published, who does this upset the most? <laughs> so, I'm thinking of a couple of sports scientists, yeah. <laughs> so, well, yeah, corpulent sports scientists, no, but uh, you know, yeah. someone's going to push back and go, oh no, you know, oh, well, you didn't do this, you didn't do that. Who are they? Not, you don't have to name their names, but so, well, but this, this how does this thing up, kind this of... opens a lovely story. So when I went low carbs, one of my great friends is Chapel called Karam Khan, who came to South Africa as he's an Australian and he spoke at our conference because I invited him. Yeah. And the reason I asked him because I was in Sydney and I heard him speak. And he said, he said something during one of the talks. And uh, I, it made me laugh so much, I realized he had a great sense of humor. So I said, you have to come to Cape Town. So he came to our conference and we sat down and I said, you know, Karim, your, your career is stuck. Because he was looking after the basketball players in the Olympic team, Australian Olympic team. I said, you'll never know if you're the best doctor for the basketball team or not. But if you get I'm into sure science, I'm sure he was very pleased when you said that to him. I said, if you get into science, you'll, you know, you can actually measure your outcomes. So he did, and then he became the editor of the British Journal of Sports Medicine, and he drove it to become the top journal in in the world in sports sciences, and he's ranked now in the top scientists in the world. So he did an amazing career. Anyway, he said, "Noakes, you complete nonsense. This diet, you see." He said, "I've been eating my." cornflakes and cereals and grains and look at me, I'm thin and athletic, you see. So, so he said, I'm going to prove you wrong. Fantastic. And so he, he changed his diet and he lost two or three kilos because he was already lean. And he said, I can't believe it, I don't have to run anymore to control my weight. So anyway, he'd written this one textbook, which I'm sure is somewhere in my library here, and uh, with a chap called Peter Bruckner. And Peter Bruckner saw this lot and he said, well, you know, Noakes is, tends to be right when he says things. I think I'm going to try the diet. And Peter was corpulent at the time. And he was working as the Australian doctor of the Australian cricket team. And also for Liverpool. I don't know how that works if you get an Australian. But, but anyway, he was the, one of the doctors working with, with Liverpool. So he went on the start and lost weight. And then he was the doctor for the Australian team playing the Ashes in England. I forget what year it was. And it must have been about 2010, 2011. Anyway, mm. they lost 5 0. You see, they lost the Australians lost the Ashes 5 0. Oh, no. And while he was reading this book, Shane Watson, who became a great friend, Shane Watson looks over his shoulder and says, Doc, what book are you reading? And it was Gary Taubes' Good Calories, Bad Calories. And then it's about good, you know, eating low carb diets. And, and Shane Watson said, You know, I've always had a problem with my diet. I've always been overweight. I've always had to starve myself at the start of the season. 
by the end of the season, I can't stop myself anymore and I put on weight again and it's terrible. And he says, my father has type 2 diabetes. So Peter says, well, maybe you should read this book. He says, he does. And then he changes his diet. And it turns out that four of the team changed their diets. They then went to Australia and played the Ashes and they won 5-0. So everyone just spots us. Well, because so anyway, as a consequence, Peter Bruckner was told that he needed to go to jail for telling the Australian cricketers to eat a low carbohydrate, high fat diet. And the lady who told him that, I've had a long relationship with her and into academically. And she said the same about me. So, ah, so, I'm getting to see... Okay. So Peter Bruckner... Was she one of the people that testified against you? No, she wasn't. She right. might have. Uh, <laughs> she be maybe maybe behind your back. <laughs> so, so anyway, so... She, so then she gives a lecture and she says that we should both be in jail. And Peter gives a lecture and he shows the slide, you see, of her saying this. And so, so anyway, that was... So then what happened about, about two years ago, the Journal of Physiology, which is a really good journal, they send me an invite to debate this lady in the journal. We've got, each got a thousand words and she's going to say, well, the high carbohydrate diet's good. And I'm going to say, well, the high fat diet's good. So I don't see what she's written, but I write my bit and I send it off and they say, no, 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 it's far too personal. No, you can't, this is not science. What ad hominem? Yeah, it's all ad hominem. What you, what they're, of, they're accusing you of yeah, being... being all okay. ad hominem. Right. See, so, so I said, no, fine, I'll change it. So I change it. So they said, no, absolutely, we cannot publish this. We're what? not going to publish it. It's a disgrace. You know, it's a disgrace? It's a disgrace. Okay. And the answer was because it was so powerful, because it shows that the, the low-carb diet is the same as the low-fat diet. So, uh, I, you know, when I hear that, I just go, okay, cool. Take all of the correspondence yeah. and just publish it on the website. Yeah. And just go, look, here I was... Because these people, you know, I find it so irritating when you're invited into a discourse. Yeah. And you're shut down because your view's just not acceptable. Yeah, that's right. And that stymies science, that stymies social intercourse, that's, it's, it, it breaks yeah. so many things and be heading towards the last two years, what's been happening for the last yeah. two years, that when you say something, or well, you just ask a question in good faith, it's like, well, hang on, why must I take this thing? Yeah. Oh, no, no, because we said you must. It's yeah. like, no, I know you said I must, but why? No, because, you know, for the good of everyone. It's like, no, that's not a good excuse. Why must I take it? It's, so anyway, the, the outcome of all that was a week later, I got an invitation to write an article by, from another journal on any, it was about low carb diets. So I did, and that, then I wrote this article, which I worked on for, for the past nine months. And that was when I came to realize that the carbohydrates are necessary to keep your blood glucose high. And so I've written that article, and that's, that's a game changer, because I put a lot of effort, and that's 60 pages and a couple of hundred references. Gosh. And it's, I don't know whether it'll be noticed or not. You see, that's the issue, whether people will take any notice. Uh, but once it's on the record, it's on the record. Yeah, it is. And I mean, that's what you can do. Yeah. That's you, you don't have the platform that you yeah. had as a, you know. So the next, to the next task is I'm rewriting Law of Running and, then, and it's beginning with all, of, all the errors and the myths in sports science. That's the first few chapters. Because my problem was when I wrote Law of Running the last time in 2002, it, was, it reflected my growth as a physiologist. And my focus was on physiology. And it was all about carbohydrates and exercise because carbohydrates determine exercise performance as we believed at that time. And so, but a lot of it, it's really good stuff, but it's now irrelevant. But I have to prove it's irrelevant by saying, well, actually the carbohydrates act in this way, they don't act in that way. And the last book was all about how they act in this way and that you can forget about that now. And now it's all the brain and that's what we need to look after. So, We talk a lot about CrossFit. Mm. Okay, I want to tell you about what happened to me. 22.2. Okay, for the CrossFit Open. Yes. The workout is, and I mustn't mess this up, uh, I think it's a pull ups, I think it's box jump overs, and then thrusters or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Get the pull ups do the box jump overs and I get to the thrusters and it's like a ladder, so it's a little bit more, so more reps, but more weight, less reps. Yeah, that's right. So I went from, no, no, no. <clears throat> I went from 
pull-ups to chest the bar and then to muscle-ups. I knew I was never getting into the muscle-ups. Yeah. I haven't yeah. got a muscle-up. Yeah. Yeah. But something quite extraordinary happened. My head broke. It, uh, and I haven't had this one for a long time. I had it on a ride once. But I went into the darkest, mm. uh, not exaggerating, darkest, darkest place. Um, I had to do it in the morning early because we usually do it on a Saturday or on a Friday morning. A whole bunch of people from the box had stayed behind uh, just to cheer me on and to so, someone to take the score. And I was doing the last set of thrusters. I think there were just 12. No? Doesn't matter how many there were. Mm. And they were heavy. Yeah, it was very heavy. Yeah. And to my lost it. Yeah. It was the first time in a very, very long time that I, I just wanted to put the thing down and just walk and just give up. Yeah. And it was, I'm not, you know, I'm smiling yeah, now. Sure. But there was like a complete, complete darkness. Mm. Complete. I was stumbling and literally flopping around. And I don't know what that was. I mean, obviously I was tired and I just kind of went out with too much gas. Yeah. But that feeling of utter hopelessness. It was like an emotional thing. <laughs> anyway, so I, I finished, I got to the end just before the muscle ups because yeah. I knew I was never going to get yeah. there. I was hoping to finish the whole thing a whole bunch earlier, but I finished the last thruster like, literally with two seconds to go. And I lay and I, I didn't move much for about half an hour. And then it became like quite emotional. Mm. But there were two things to it, like weepy, and then there was this strange thing. It was this utter elation. Mm. It was like, I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the endorphins, I don't know. But there was, a, there was the darkness and then there was the recovery. And it was, I felt like huggy. It sounds quite strange. What is that? <laughs> what the hell is that? Yeah, it's the first time I've heard it described like that, so I wouldn't have any clue. It, it was the strangest yeah. thing, looked at, but, but running out of the gas, I've had it while I've cycled. Yeah. yeah. You know, I used to oh, that's cycle. easy, oh, that's easy. But there's, there's nothing. Yeah. It's, there's no, the body's just not working. Mm. Not sore, not in pain. The, the difference in, in CrossFit and running is that with CrossFit, you have this maximal effort. That's the difference, that there's, you know, each of those contractions is close to maximal. Those thrusters, each of them is... So you're operating at 90% you, you know, on each rep. Absolutely. Whereas running... You're, at, you're going at 50% or something, 60%. You're recruiting a much smaller muscle mass and the brain's under less pressure. So, so that when you're running and then you come up the last hill in this race or the finishing line, you're only recruiting 40, 50% of the mass of muscles in your legs. You think you're recruiting 100%. Because you're in pain, is yeah, that why? That's, well, the pain is to make sure you don't recruit more than 50%, because if you recruit more than 50%, something's going to go wrong. Okay. So that's how the system, and it produces that discomfort to make sure you don't get any, do anything wrong. When you're doing these maximum contractions, it's quite different. The brain is, is working at close to its maximum. And also the potential for damage is quite high, so that it's also trying to judge that as well, and to make sure you don't do, overdo it. So that's what, what was happening in your brain. It's a massive depletion. Yeah, you're, you're recruiting a, a massive amount of muscle. That muscle is complaining, and the brain is getting that information, and you're overriding it. You've got to override it to do the next one, the second, and the third, and the fourth. And the brain's got to predict, anticipate, how many is it going to allow you to do? It doesn't know you're going to stop after 12. Maybe it does, but... It, you know, but your brain yeah, doesn't. Maybe it doesn't know. Well, the central government doesn't know. Is that... Yeah. Are we going in the right that's direction? The yeah, that's correct. It doesn't... It, it, it can't be certain that you're going to stop after 10 or 12. Because this is a reptilian response. This yeah. isn't an intellectual... No, not at all. This is not something that you think about. No, this you, is can't, a, you can't change that. This but, is something yeah. else. But that can be yeah. overridden. Up to a point. But, but you, with the, the danger in these things is, is your cardiovascular system is really under great duress. You know, when you lift weights, your blood pressure shoots up to above 400. So you can easily sh shoot a few blood vessels. What well, counts that? Yeah. So is that what that kind of, you know, if you're doing like a deadlift, is that yeah. that kind of feeling of... Yeah, well, then you, and you drop it and then you can get your blood pressure drops quite rapidly. And then you fall over. Yeah. And there's a lot of videos yeah. I can on YouTube. <laughs> That's right. That would be. So then, uh, something I've been interested in. To run, yes. to cycle, you're spending two and a half hours on the bike, 
to achieve, mm. to, to try and achieve some kind of fitness. CrossFit workout is 15 minutes. But I don't think I've ever been fitter now no. than I've ever been in my entire yeah. life. And I've run marathons. Yeah. I've run two very slow, two oceans, very slow. Done a lot of mountain biking. But now I'm far more fitter than yeah, I've ever been true. with one hour a day. I mean, when I was training for Epic, because I also had very little money, I just got a gym yeah. and spin for up to three hours. Three, three hours mm. spinning classes. And so it's giving a lot of time on the bike but nowhere near as strong and as fit as yeah, I right. So how does that work? Because the muscle's not really being taxed. Yeah, it's, you, when you're in CrossFit, your muscles are being taxed close to the maximum, and that's, that's the key. So when you tax a muscle close to its maximum, you don't need much effort to produce a training effect. And, how does and what, also you're using the, all your body, which is, you, don't, you know, when you're running, you're just using your legs. But when CrossFit, you're using everything else in the body. So running, you completely ignore your upper body and your, particularly your back. And I suspect that the back is very important for your, for your health and your fitness and your feelings of, of strength. So I've, I've heard it said that grip strength is a great predictor of yeah. longevity. Yeah, absolutely. But I would say they're much better ones. Which ones? Um, Happiness. <laughs> no. no. Uh, how many burpees can you do? <laughs> Something like Don't that. talk to me about burpees. Yeah. I hate burpees. Yeah, those are... Those are really tough, or, or warbles. I mean, that's, you know, that's an incredibly difficult activity. It's, it's also deeply unpleasant. Yeah, it is. I mean, you know, you're using so much, using a huge amount of muscle, which you don't use in running or cycling. Okay. So, just carrying on in this theme. What does it mean to be fit? I don't understand. Okay, I, know what it, I know what it means for me. Yeah, it means you've got to be fit for your pur for purpose, fit for what you train for. That's... So the definition of fitness is determined by what you're doing. So if you're running, you're fit to run. If you swim, you're fit to Physiologically, swim. what does it mean if you're fit? Does it mean that your heart is big? I mean, are you training your... So as a runner, are you training your muscle? The muscle that you're training, is that your heart? So if I'm going to be a weightlifter, I'm going to train my shoulders and my arms. Yeah. Now, the heart comes along for the ride. Most of the training is in the muscle itself. And it took a long time for people to realize that. So when I started physiology, we were thought taught that it's all in a muscle. But as soon as they started doing muscle biopsies, then they could see that the muscle has adapted. So, so the met metabolism and the power output changes in, with training in the muscles. And that's the muscle, so it's a muscular thing. Yeah, it's a muscular fitness. The heart comes along, it's just pumping the oxygen, keeping you cool and those sorts of things. Yeah. So you, you could have <laughs> two atoms, yeah. a 78 or 74 kilo atom, who's never done CrossFit before, and the 70, Four kilo Adam, who's busy doing CrossFit. We look the same. Kind of, what's well, the difference? What's the actually same. happening? Well, apart from the slightly more defined yeah, muscles and muscle. a bit thicker around the chest. Yeah. yeah. So it's just the ability to carry load over distance. Yeah, and you're training a totally different set of muscles for a different purpose. Yeah, when you when you're training for running or cycling, as you did, the focus is just to move your body on a bicycle you know, as efficiently as you can, for as long as you can. And the body adapts by becoming much better at metabolizing fats, for example. Your heart increases its capacity to keep pumping well for a couple of hours. And mentally you're adapted to having to sit on a bike for three hours. And to manage pain. Yeah. So I think a lot of endurance running is just managing pain over a long distance. Yeah. Or managing discomfort. Which you generate, your brain dis generates the discomfort to make sure you don't do, don't harm yourself. And are the best cyclists, the guys that can just put that in the pocket and just keep going? Yeah, they, well, they first obviously have to have a desire to do it. That's, that's the key to get up every day and cycle six hours a day. So, so where I'm going with this, what's yeah. the difference between a guy like Chris Froome and Vincent Nibali at, their, at the outer extremities of their performance? Why was Biologically, there's no difference. You know, you could test them. You would not be able to. So what is it that breaks? Because I always looked at Naira Quintana and I always yeah. went, what's wrong with you? Yeah. You are so strong and you've, you've got such a lovely body. What was it? Just a mental thing that he just couldn't the dig deep enough? The was never quite the same. I mean, that's, that's to be special, to be extra special. So that's quite psychic. I remember, that's like quite... I remember the one athlete who was a great friend of mine who kept coming second in the comrades. And he said, I'm absolutely comfortable with that. He said, because I'm... I live my life and 
the winning doesn't isn't that important to me. And if the South Africans you know think I'm a loser, that's fine, because I'm not prepared to give up stuff to become first. That was that's what he said. You know, the family and children to look after. Yeah. And that's the difference. It's the sacrifice. Because yeah. for the marginal gain, for the yeah, gain of absolutely. 0 point, yeah. I don't know, let's take, yeah. talk about sprinting, for the 0 point yeah. 0 0.2 seconds, yeah. the amount of extra work you have to absolutely. do is just... Yeah. And that becomes your life. And then, and then you have to ask, was it worth it? And you only know that once you finish. And you know, there are so many athletes, professional athletes, who's, who have a disastrous post-career. Yeah, you have to be looking after yourself in more than just winning the races. But then this is the exact office. I don't know if you ever read Andre Agassi's book, Open. Yeah, have yeah. you read it? No, but I know okay, what so the story is. It's, it's extraordinary. The yeah. first chapter yeah. is just an internal narration of him getting out of bed. Mm. Like from uh, opening my eyes, my neck sore, and then he describes what he had done to his neck yeah. to make it sore, and then oh, my shoulders, and then Steffi's busy with the kids, and was like, and he was going through a catalog of industries, uh, Injury. injuries, and discomforts in his career, and how he got to this day, and he was going to play an exhibition yeah. match or something. Yeah. But then he goes through the book and describes how much he hates tennis. Tennis, yeah, he, he hated it, yeah. and his addiction. Um, with all kinds of illicit drugs and stuff. But he still went out there and did it. Yeah. And he, blamed, he blamed his father. He didn't yeah. thank his father for yeah. making him a good athlete. He blamed his father. Yeah. Which is quite an interesting thing. I mean, so he got to the top, yeah. but didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And yeah. he looks back on it and goes, okay, well, that's not really something that I was, you know, I did it because it was expected of me. Mm. But then you see a lot of these athletes that perform at the highest level, who after their careers, their, their personal lives become an absolute mess. Yeah, yeah. Because they can't manage, what is it? I mean, do you have sports psychologists that deal with this? What they can't manage civilian life. Is it like a Marine coming home from Vietnam? Yeah, they can't exactly. manage the civilian, yeah. you know? Well, you, you know, Michael Phelps is a good example who almost committed suicide, despite the fact that he won how many? 28 Olympic gold medals. It was like Dan Vickerman. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, he was a guy, he was, he was one of my new boys at school. Yeah. He was such a sweet guy. Yeah. And these guys really suffer. Mm -hmm. No, competitive sport's not, not an easy, it's not an easy life. Yeah. People don't understand it. No, exactly right. But competitive science also not so <laughs> is as brutal. <laughs> yes, exactly. I mean, I mean, it takes its toll. It's yeah. taken its toll on you. Yeah. You had a hell of a ride for 10 years. But anything, I think if you get to the end of any... When you explore the margins of excellence, you've got to give up a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And I mean, it's like being a lawyer. You know, I could have been at that law firm. I could still, I could have probably would have been a partner then. Yeah. But yeah. I wasn't willing to give up hanging out with my kids. Yeah, that's right. Doing the work that I do, having this conversation, because these are billable hours. Yeah. I'd be charging, <laughs> no, no, I'd be charging 5,000 Rand an hour. Exactly. This is me losing my budget. I'm going like, oh, I'm not going to give anything to, having the foundation entertain these emails but it's about you know what more what is it that you actually want yeah and that's the that's the issue many of us don't ask that question or people don't ask that question when they get involved oh yeah it's just i there are many things i would tell people not to do like? on the basis of my experiences well being a medicine i would never advise anyone to study medicine what would you have done so let's just take, like, yeah. awesome, okay. <laughs> awesome, what would you have done? No, I mean, I'm very happy that I did medicine, I, because I had an out. Okay. So very soon I, when I got into medicine, I realized I was much more interested in the why, okay. and the what and the how. Oh, you mean medicine is an actual profession? Yeah, as a profession. Uh, okay, yeah. so as a practitioner. Yeah, it's an unbelievable training. It's a fantastic training, but it's a disastrous profession. Why is that? because you have to give, give your life up to it. And the people who are in, at a higher level are just so atrocious. <laughs> you just, you know, you know what they did to me. And these are the, the leaders of medicine in South Africa. And they're meant to be leading the, the ethics and the morality, but there's nothing, there's no morality and ethics there, if, if you saw what they did to me. But, uh, but that's not the point. But as a practitioner, I mean, yeah. I mean it doesn't... But medical practice is a disaster because you direct it. You can't decide for yourself what to do. There are guidelines which are set somewhere else. 
And those guidelines are set by the pharmaceutical industry to sell product. And, and what young doctors are realizing is that it doesn't work. Your patients just get sicker. They come and see you and you give them this medication which doesn't work and they get sicker. And then they treat the side effects of the medication. Exactly. The beauty of the low carbs is that you actually can help patients and make them healthy. So the without, only doctors, without medicine. Yeah, you know, the only doctors who are working exactly that coach practitioners. You you have to coach your patient, and it's not coach them how to take medication. It's how to live a healthy life, which which starts with nutrition, but goes to exercise and sleep and stress management and so on. So this isn't actually medic medical practice. It's no, a, no. you know, I suppose in the olden days you would have had the old wise man, your shaman, or I don't yeah, know, your exactly. wizard, or your exactly. witch, or your soothsayer or your guy, the dude who's just wise, and it's like, no, don't do that. Yeah. That's not a good... Uh, was that, I suppose that's a role that doctors played. I mean, you'd phone up your GP, and the GP would come around on the white coat with the stethoscope exactly. and his black case, and he would dispense with wisdom, and you say, okay, well, the Dr. Tavi said I must, and yeah. I'm like, okay, cool. But doc doctors have lost that, that, that moral authority. They're not, they're not allowed to, you see, now I think you just have to, because A, you only see the patient for 15 minutes and you can't treat a patient in 15 minutes, it's impossible. You know, you need to see the patient for a couple of hours to really help them. But that's a sick patient, if you yeah, look like snotty Well, eyes. yeah, but you need to, to get your patients on the right track to become healthy. You also need to give them an hour or so of your time. But there's, but there's, not, there's no role for that.